physicsinfo.co.uk, another in the series of Physics GCSE Revision Topics. Topic 12, Magnetic Fields and Magnetism. Separate Science. We come across magnets all the time. Magnets of iron, cobalt and nickel have a wide range of uses. You see them in fridge magnets, speakers and headphones, electric motors, door catches, even the obvious compasses. Make sure you can remember at least one example of a use. Starting with the basics of magnetism. Like poles repel, unlike poles attract. A north and a south pole will attract each other. A south and a south pole will repel each other. And a north and a north will repel. Magnetic materials such as iron, cobalt and nickel can be magnetised permanently or they can be made into temporary and or even induced magnets. A needle is made magnetic by stroking a magnet past it. Stick it through a piece of cork and it floats. Just like a compass, it's affected by the invisible forces of a magnetic field. Paper clips and a steel nail are not normally magnetic. You can see here the magnet and the clips are not at all attracted. Steel, however, is a magnetic material, so both the paper clips and the nail experience a force in a magnetic field. Both the clips and the nail can be attracted to the magnet. Attaching the magnet to the nail means that the field lines can be concentrated through the magnetic nail, turning the nail into a temporary magnet. Remove the magnet and the nail itself is no longer magnetic. This is called induced magnetism. Using a stronger nickel or cobalt magnet perhaps makes this even clearer. Many more paper clips are picked up. I mentioned field lines. Bar magnets have magnetic field lines associated with them. Field lines travel from north to south and they do not cross. The closer together the lines are, the greater the field strength. Cover a normal bar magnet with just a sheet of paper and the field lines can be shown by sprinkling iron filings over the paper. This magnet is surrounded by iron filings suspended in a liquid. The magnetic field lines go all the way around it. Iron filings can be used to show the even uniform field between the two opposite poles. The Earth too has a magnetic field and a compass can be used to show the direction of the field lines associated with the Earth. This animation shows a plotting compass being used to follow the field lines as they go, in this case, from south to north. Magnetic fields are invisible. 
but small compasses show up a pattern. Each curved line is a line of magnetic force. The red pointed end of an arrow on a compass points towards a magnetic south. This means the Earth's north pole is actually a magnetic south. The Earth is surrounded by a magnetic field. It behaves as if there's a huge bar magnet running from north to south deep inside the Earth. And this animation shows that for the arrows of a compass to point towards the top of the Earth, the top of the Earth has to be a magnetic south pole. There are also magnetic fields associated with the current flowing in a wire. Current travelling along a wire produces a magnetic field. The field is stronger nearest the wire and when the current is greater. The direction of this field is given by the right hand or corkscrew rule. When a current flows through this wire, the compass needle deflects to one side. An electric current produces a magnetic field. Plotting compasses show the circular field pattern around the wire. This is the right hand or corkscrew rule, where the thumb on the right hand gives the direction of the current and the fingers wrapped around give the direction of the field. Using your right hand, grip the wire. The thumb gives the direction of the current and the blue circle shows the field going in a clockwise direction. The diagram shows a wire with current going into the paper. The field lines go around the wire in a clockwise direction. In fact, they're closer together, nearer the wire, and further apart as you get further and further away. The diagram also shows the field lines associated with a magnet. Field lines cannot cross, and as a result, they bunch up above the wire, pushing the wire downwards. This is called the kicking wire effect. Current flowing in the wire causes a magnetic field which interacts with the magnet causing the wire to kick, in this case, upwards. Fleming's left-hand rule can be used to show the relative directions of the field, the current and the resulting force. These two magnets provide that field, depicted here by the blue lines. When charged particles enter a magnetic field, the field exerts a force on them. You can use your hands to find out the direction of that force. Position your left hand like so, with your index finger pointing in the direction of the magnetic field, your middle finger pointing in the direction of the current, and your thumb pointing up, forming a right angle with your index finger. An ammeter can be used to measure the current flowing and a balance to measure the change in force. It's usually the field that's calculated. This experiment is an example of how you might calculate the field. Don't forget that weight is a force. In the picture, conventional current flows through the magnetic field along the aluminium rod from left to right. And this is it represented in a diagram. The current flows from positive to negative and the magnetic field lines go from the north to south. The field is away from us from north to south 
and is lifting the bar up using Fleming's left hand rule. The bar is heavy and doesn't lift, so using Newton's third law, action and reaction are equal and opposite, the magnet is pushed down. Reading the mass off the balance and multiplying by g, you can find the force being applied. Now you need to read the length of the rod actually in the magnetic field. Converting everything to SI units, that's grams to kilograms, uh, centimetres to metres, and using the form F equals BIL, or rearranging the form F equals BIL, you can calculate the value of the magnetic field strength. There is often confusion between the symbols I and L in this formula, so be careful. It turns out that the strength of this magnet, a fairly typical laboratory magnet, comes in at about 0.22 Tesla. Wires can also be wrapped into coils, and we call these coils of wires solenoids. A solenoid is an example of an electromagnet. Field lines around the individual wires merge to form a strong uniform field inside and a weaker field outside. You've probably even built an electromagnet by wrapping a wire around a nail and passing a current through. A coil of wire with an electric current flowing through it produces a field similar to that of a bar magnet. As the electricity is switched on and off, so is the magnetic field. And you can see that this diagram represents the field lines associated with a solenoid. One end is a north pole with the field lines going around the outside to the south pole. And looking in a bit more detail at each individual wire of the solenoid, each wire has its own associated field line. These field lines join up and because they can't cross, they are compressed into a uniform field inside of the solenoid and a more spread out, weaker field outside. Electric motors and the motor effect. The forces acting on a current flowing in a wire, shown earlier, can be used to cause a flat coil of wire to rotate, one wire being pushed up, the other being pushed down. Using a commutator, these forces can be continuously applied, and that's the principle of an electric motor. You can see on the lower right diagram that the commutator allows the left-hand side of the coil to always be connected to the positive side of the battery. In this case, according to Fleming's left-hand rule, the left-hand side is always pushed down and the right-hand side is always pushed up. The Westminster kit is a simple kit for building an electric motor. The motor is built on a wooden baseboard with a metal yoke and two magnets. The magnets must be attached with the North Pole facing the South Pole. Two split pins are used to provide a pivot point for the flat coil of wire. A thin spindle is allowed to rotate freely between the pins and the spindle passes through the middle of a flat coil. The two bare wires at the end are arranged in the same plane as the coil, one either side. Electrical contacts are set up, with some difficulty in this case, so that a bare wire is sitting vertically either side and perpendicular to the plane of the coil.
These wires act as a very crude commutator. The flat coil can rotate freely brushing against them. When contact is made, the wires in the coil should feel a force. This force changes direction every half rotation, creating a motor effect. Looking slightly more closely, you can see that the wires from the power supply are vertical, whilst the coil of wire is in a horizontal plane, contact is made. And that's it. Thank you for watching.